So I gave it to him. All right, we're about to get started, folks. Waiting for the YouTube to do its thing, and then we'll do our thing. All right. Okay, we are live. Welcome <laughs> to Queer Futures and Queer Past with Mike Albo and Marianne Cherry. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am the co founder with my partner, Donna Jokum, of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which is where you find yourselves right now. And the Bureau, we'd like to say, is a government agency for a government that does not exist. And this is what we do. Our service is holding this space for queer culture. Uh, so we have regular bookstore hours Wednesdays through Sundays from 1 to 7 p.m. And then we stay open later when we have uh, events in the evenings. And if you're not yet on our email list and you'd like to be, you can sign up for that at the back of the room. You'll get an email every other day. So the Bureau is an all volunteer organization, which means I'm going to ask you for money. Um, our suggested donation is ten dollars but we always say give what you can if you can and if you plan on buying books that's a perfectly legitimate way of supporting us you don't have to do both but you can do both <laughs> um you can also venmo us at bgsqd for those of you watching us online and those letters are all around you so you can't screw it i'll pass that around there's some change in the bag um before i introduce our panelists, I'm going to read a land acknowledgement. So the Bureau acknowledges that our organization operates on the unceded land of the Bunsi Lenape. We are actively seeking to partner with and provide material support to a local queer indigenous organization. We hope to make an announcement about this partnership in the near future. But in the meantime, we encourage you to join the Bureau in signing up to make a monthly donation to the American Indian Community Houses Manhattan Fund. So yes, you're donating to us and then we're donating to Manhattan Fund. That's how it goes. We just cycle through money. <laughs> it's a shell game. <laughs> <laughs> the Manhattan Fund, according to its website, is an invitation to all settlers and non-Native people who wish to acknowledge the legacy of theft and genocide that comprise the history of New York City and the United States. And you can find out more at manahattafund.org. So Marianne Cherry has been based in Los Angeles for 45 years, is a writer with a diverse background in network and syndicated television and independent documentary films. Cherry has worked with nonprofit organizations, most recently created the Historical Archive for AIDS Healthcare Foundation. She befriended and worked with Moritz Kite during the last decade of his life, which led to Kite giving his blessing for Cherry to write his biography. They shared a friendship and a passion for social justice and activism. She enjoys a second career as an in-demand specialized yoga therapist. Stick around. <laughs> MarianneCherryWriter.com is where you can find out more. Mike Albo is the author of three novels, Cornito, considered one of the 50 essential LGBT works of fiction by Flavor Wire, the cult classic, The Underminer, The Best Friend Who Casually Destroys Your Life, written with Virginia Hefferman, and Another Dimension of Us, released in 2023. His other works include The Junket and Spermhood, Diary of a Donor. He has written for The New Yorker, New York Magazine, TED, Town and Country, and numerous other outlets. He has performed nine solo and nine solo and comedy shows across the US, Canada, and UK. His solo shows include Spermhood, Diary of a Donor, and The Junket, which ran off Broadway at the Lynn Redgrave Theater in 2015. You can find out more at MikeElbow.net. Please give them a very warm welcome. So uh, when Mary and I first thought about pairing up, um, I was like, shit, what are we gonna, it's the combination here, like, <laughs> um, because her book is like this incredibly well-researched biography and my book is completely bonkers. So I was like, <laughs> what is this central theme? But then it became easier than I thought it was gonna be because I read uh, your book and realized that the characters in my book and me when I was 15 would have had such a better time if we had role models or even knew about people like 
Morse kite. And then, um, you know, all these themes came up for me about uh, history and whose history is told and um, the importance of history. And uh, especially now as we're seem to be repeating history and being tried, tried to be erased again. Um, so I usually read from the beginning of the book because it's easiest, but um, I'm choosing two brief passages that have to do with the past and with history. But the only problem is now I have to set it up and it's going to be kind of hard. Okay, so I'm going to hope, hopefully I can do it. You guys are going to be like, that makes total sense. <laughs> um, so another dimension of us is about a group of queer 15 year old outcasts who live in the past and the future in a suburb of Virginia um, in 1986 and 2044. And in both times, they find this mysterious book on astral projection. And if you don't know what astral projection is, it's like this idea that you can leave your body and your soul can travel to different planes, to the lower plane, the higher plane, and all these different places. Um, in 2044, we meet Chris, who is athletic, black, and out lesbian at school, but not very well liked um, because of the way she looks mostly. Um, her best friend is Jade, who is a trans non-binary individual who is just coming out into their beauty. And um, Chris feels like they're growing distant. Um, and then in 1986, we meet Tommy, who is gay, but definitely not out at 15 years old because it's the 80s. Um, he's also bullied at school. His last name just ironically happens to be gay. -A -Y -E. <laughs> um, and he has a hopeless crush on his new friend, this beautiful budding poet named Ronaldo, who also goes by Renee. Um, and he's got, he's got a huge crush on Renee and Renee's this beautiful, amazing poet. And Renee takes him to the library and into the woods and Tommy thinks that they're gonna make out. And then Renee gets really freaked out. He's been really into that, this astral projection book and it's, he's kind of getting really erratic and weird and um, they don't make out and Tommy gets really sad. And then Renee gets struck by lightning and then he, falls into a coma, then he comes out of the coma and he's a completely different person. And he's like Mr. Popular Jock Guy. And <laughs> he ignores Tommy at school. Um, and Tommy's like, why? He's acting like he's possessed. And, uh, and, and then also Tommy's been seeing this little weird, strange girl around town too. Um, okay, so this passage. Uh, the bell rang, his face burning, Tommy ducked into oral history, into his history class and sat at his desk, refusing to look up. He was still processing what happened, seeing Renee ignore him, hanging out with Stacy Devine and Welsh Walsh as if he had become popular overnight. Even his eyes had changed. He couldn't stop thinking about his best friend's strange, suddenly greenish hazel eyes. He felt like he had been stabbed with a knife. His teacher, Mr. Roman, a short, wiry man with a slow, torpid energy droned on and on. Every lesson seemed boring, like history had never happened, or if it did, that all was left was endless paragraphs about bank bonds and presidents. That week, they were learning about the events leading up to World War II, and Mr. Roman had told them to read the corresponding chapter in their huge four-pound tome, World History at a Glance. So, so, so as you read in your chapter, the Spanish Civil War was a precursor to World War II. What are the three factors that led to the larger conflict? No one answered the course. Mr. Roman sighed. Well, what do we know there were vast amounts of? There were vast amounts of... Tommy ducked his head and tried to make himself invisible so he wasn't called on. He hadn't read the assignment because he was too obsessed with Renee's new personality. Stacy? Um, Grain? Stacy Devine answered. Someone exhaled in disgust in the back. <laughs> Mr. Roman looked up. Oh, yeah, I should have introduced you. Everyone, please welcome the new student to Heron High School, Miss. Mr. Roman looked down at his roll book. Una, he hesitated. Lustrada, una lustrada, someone said in a rasp as if her vocal cords were damaged. Her voice sounded familiar. Tommy turned around. It was that strange girl he had saw at the library. She was wearing the same old outfit, plaid skirt with a black woolly sweater, the shirt underneath the brown like it had been dyed in dark tea. She looked sickly, her face tinged green. When she spoke, he saw that she had gray teeth like those of a skeleton, but her eyes were strange, otherworldly color of hazel, bright and glowing. After the Spanish Civil War, there was a lot of income inequality, Una explained. The landowners had teamed up with the church 
who owned even more land and tried to put a stop to the democratic reforms being instated by the new republic. She had an accent Tommy couldn't place, probably because I'm doing a terrible job. <laughs> uh, but for some other place, some other time. Uh, that's right. And so, but if you seem to see that to reduce the civil war to simple cause of World War II, do you know how many people died? How hard it is to live then? In Madrid, we had no food because Franco had sold us out, starving us into submission. I mean, they had no food. <laughs> Mr. Roman stood there speechless. The class had turned to look at this odd pale girl named Una Lustrada and collectively glared. They just wanted the class to end so they could leave school for the weekend. Mike Brady, Tommy's seatmate, already had his Walkman on. Una looked down, at, looked at the room. Her eyes settled on Tommy. He quickly turned away. She formed her face into a grin and waved away the air with her modeled hands. Sorry, my uh, grandparents are uh, Spanish. They told me to understand. Then she coughed violently, clearing her throat. I'm sorry, allergies. <laughs> <laughs> the class went on soporifically. Tommy just learned that word from Renee, along with coronoscopy, effulgent, and unctuous. Where was the Renee he knew? Mr. Roman led the class out early. Tommy darted into the hall. There were 10 minutes before the end of school, a Friday, and Tommy needed to get to his lock before everyone else so he could avoid being called names. He was about to head home when something stopped him. It was like his body took over, the body that had held Renee and stroked his hair. He found himself walking towards Ronaldo's locker on the other side of school. He would confront him. He would ask for the truth. He would demand to know why he was ignoring him. The bell rang and the students poured out into the halls. Weekend giddy, they scurried around him. He saw Rene with Welsh Walsh walking away from his locker. They chatted and Ronaldo punched him in the shoulder affectionately in the way maybe gladiators did in Rome. <laughs> Tommy saw Welsh grab the back of Rene's neck and pull him close. They were being affectionate, but in that sporty way that guys can do in their jobs. <laughs> it was everything Tommy wanted to do with Renee, but couldn't because he couldn't throw a football or make a basket. Hot waves of desire and sadness burned through him. He thought of all the poems he had written about Renee, how he was, he was a languid black smoke and how he was nestling doves and how he was carved shadows. He wasn't any of that. He was just a liar. Tommy walked through the exit doors to his bike and jangled the chain to unlock it. All the cool kids were hanging out around their cars. One car revved its engine loudly. Tommy looked up and heard someone from the back seat yell, Ooh, it's gay. Don't give me AIDS, gay, and drive off. Tommy could swear he saw the back of Renee's head in the car, too. No, it could be him who's the one who said it. No. He stood there as if splashed with icy water, shivering. The car drove off to whatever pool party of beer and sex and pleasure and cakes and watermelon soaked vodka was happening. Tommy should have kissed him that night at the tree or at any night or even every night this summer. But now Rene was walking with Welsh, a pairing that just felt a few days ago would have been incomprehensible. But now, because Tommy's entire world was upside down, it was happening right in front of him. He had to get out of there. He jumped on his bike and rode off, hoping no one would see his tears. Okay. Um, hold on. Thank you. <laughs> Showbiz. Um, so, oh, I forgot to also say the, the plan of action here. I'm just gonna read a little bit more, then Marianne's gonna present, and then we're gonna talk a little bit, and then if there's some questions, we can answer the questions, and then maybe we'll go to Julius and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story. Um, okay. So this next section is pretty brief, but it, I really wanted to read it because I think it'll, it'll um, something to talk about. Um, so Una is from the astral plane, and she helps Tommy. Um, she tells Tommy that Tom that Renee isn't who Renee is, and that he's trapped. He's been abducted and trapped up in the astral plane, and um, she's going to help him get to him to save him. Um, Meanwhile, in 2044, Pris discovers that Jade has been abducted too, because the person who abducts these people really likes hot people. You know, you know. So <laughs> I had the power to be like, yeah, you. Um, anyway, so, 
So the two of them meet and they're trying to travel through the lower plane, which is full of all this really fucked up shit, to find their friends with the help of this spirit guide named Lolly, who isn't your typical spirit spirit guide. He's um, actually a cartoon kids um, kids serial mascot, like like Captain Crunch sort of. And he has lollipops for here and he's really <laughs> um, In this scene, they're rolling along in Lolly's wagon to the astral plane. And Chris has been kind of angry and defensive to Tom. The wagon continued rolling. Gradually, the sky grew cloudier as if a mist were descending into the valley. It felt wet. Soon, three, the three were in fog. It seemed to absorb sound, even the incessant wagon songs muffled. Ah, we're getting close to the passage, yelled Lolly from the driver's seat. Passage to the higher plane? Yappers. How can you tell? Feel the air, it's tingly. Lolly stretched out his clown hands and his hair jangled. He coughed afterward like he was coming down to the cold. He was right, the air was agitated, full of energy, like being near an ocean on the edge of something powerful. The sky grew dark. Lolly clicked his tongue and stuck his thumb in his mouth, making a popping noise, and the lollipops in his hair lit up like lamps, beaming around them. It just gets less visible the closer to it, to ward off simpler beings. There's a few hurdles to get into to the gateway. Chris tossed her disc back and forth between her hands. Hey, Tommy said tentatively, are, are you okay? Chris looked at him and watched him flinch as if he was waiting for her to snap again. Her face softened. He was a nice person and she felt bad for making him feel nervous around her. Perhaps the fog in the air made it easier to talk because it felt insular and concealed like a confessional. I'm just so worried about Jade, Chris finally said. I don't know what I'll do if I lose them. Tommy bit his lip. Do you like, um, like her? Them, I mean, sorry. Oh, you mean am I like attracted to them? No, 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 I love Jade, but not that way. Just because we're both queer doesn't mean, wait, you call yourself queer? Yeah, why? Tommy laughed. The absurdity dawned on him. Wow, so in the future, it becomes okay to say you're queer. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> That's what you call yourself. That's the term you use in your time. Tommy laughed again. What's so funny? It's just that this, like, in my time, it's the worst thing you can call somebody besides, um, well, this other word. Oh, yes, that one. That word's still a big one. <laughs> but queer. That's okay. Uh-huh. It's a compliment, I guess, in a way. No. <laughs> well, where I'm from, queer used to be somebody who was weak, like the game Smear the Queer on the playground. My brother used to play with the other kids. What's that game? You know, I'm not sure. Someone is picked and then everyone has to tackle them while they run around and try to escape being tackled. That's awful. But I guess in a way it's hopeful because look how much life can change. Tommy looked down at his legs. Chris noticed his eyes were tearing up. I miss Renee. He's like Jade to me. But more than that, you like him. Chris watched Tommy's face clench. I mean, as a, as a friend, but also maybe I, no, you like like him, you're queer. <laughs> no, I'm not. He shot back defensively, as if he wasn't even thinking, just reacting. Chris saw his face in the dim, colorful light, the anger and hurt in his eyes. She tried to remember what Mr. Richards told her about that time, her teacher, that people felt shame for who they loved. She couldn't understand it, not entirely. She felt a stab of guilt. She turned to Tommy and put her hand on his shoulder. It's cool. You, you don't have to be ashamed. Not with me, not now. Tommy was shivering. It's just so hard. Go ahead and say it. I bet you'll feel better. Say what? You know. She watched as Tommy held his breath and bit his lip. He glanced around the, the area as if he was checking for police or someone who would immediately kill him. I'm, um, it's okay, Tommy. It's not gonna hurt you. I'm, um, I'm queer? Tommy exhaled, I'm, I'm queer. His lower lip curled into a cry as if his face had stored the words in his mouth for so long they were cramping. Overhead, they heard creaking, like wooden boats were bobbing above their heads. In the mist, they couldn't see anything, but it sounded like trees were surrounding them, giant oaks croaking and bending in a powerful wind. Are we in a forest? I can't tell. Honestly, I've never taken this path to the higher plane, Molly said, puzzled. Over the creeks was another sound, sipping and inhaling, 
as if there was a giant bathtub and the drain was sucking in water. Dark figures started coming into view around them. The mist gave way and they saw that they were indeed surrounded by trees, but there were no leaves on the ground, no branches overhead, just these massive croaking trunks. Wow, this place is so isolated. Hello, Chris yelled. The echo took a longer time coming back. Hello, called Tommy. Guess what? I'm queer. I'm queer. <laughs> <laughs> he giggled while he said it. Wait, said Lolly. I'm queer, said Tommy, delighting himself. Shh, Lolly scolded, grabbing Tommy by the shoulders. Lolly looked deeply into his eyes. These aren't trees. They're giant ghosts. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So um, thank you all for being here, taking time away from your coronation duties. <laughs> it, was big, it, was a hard, it was a hard call. Um, I, um, I moved from New Jersey to Venice, California in 1977. Sorry. And that was the first time that I heard about this old man who lived in downtown Los Angeles and he'd have yard sales on Sundays. And yard sales were not a big deal at the time. But they actually they fronted as a there was a underground secret uh, STD treatment in the back one of the back rooms because in those days if you were unfortunate to have such a diagnosis the doctor was required to report you to the board of health and very often your employer was notified your partner and you may have e even gotten your name into the newspaper with this information. So it was, it was a public health crisis just trying to happen. And Morris got doctors, this guy got doctors to treat people off the books. And so then I eventually moved into town and I started hearing the name Morris Kite. And I always related it as activists and radicalism. And then eventually I got to know him, I met him and I got to know him. And um, he, was, he was everything more than I could have imagined. Uh, so this part that I'm going to read is from the introduction of the book, which is really the only part in the book where I address you, the reader, from me personally. Um, I had to type, I had to print them out because I can't read from the book. Can I get this a little bit closer? So that's it. Okay, that's good. Um, I mean, and I'd use this. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. That's okay. We're just having technical glitches, but great. there we go. Let me go back to, okay, good. So I knew Morris personally for the final 10 years of his life. I was familiar with the 6 a.m. phone calls that many people whom I interviewed had also experienced. The phone would ring at 6 a.m. and a chipper Morris kite would be on the other end of the line with hardly a courtesy, narrating the day's agenda, all of which would be news to me. He would begin by making a statement about something that needed to happen that day under his direction as a priority and then give me just enough time to agree or disagree to join his magic carpet ride for the day. And just as quickly the line, the phone line would die. Where there once was the sound of Morris Kite, there was silence. He hung up as soon as business was completed, nary a goodbye. He was too busy going down a list written on a yellow legal pad, getting about the day's business of righting wrongs and changing the world. Often we had lunch, we talked about everything, politics, men, relationships, family, a little gossip, always peppered with his tales of olden times. He told me many stories, a good number of which are included here. He spoke with, with specificity about his early life in Texas. He felt very affected by it and he never dared a complete analysis of himself. I could almost imagine the envision the mini version of the grown up Morris Kite moving through the crude macho world of East Texas in the early 1920s with his perfect posture and elocution. He was by his own admission, an odd kid. <laughs> in the course of researching this book as expected, I came to know and understand Morris, the man, the liberator, the negotiator, the media genius and the egomaniac much better than I had gotten to know him during those lunches. I always sensed that he was a complex individual, but I had no idea what was in store for me. It turned out my gut feeling was correct. He had been sitting on a great story. The fact that he was an innate radical was no surprise. Morris was not a weekend liberal who facilitated a grassroots movement once or twice in his life. No, Morris was a lifelong activist dedicated to the bigger, grander cause in the name of good 
and none of this was news. Kite, the grand panjandrum of gay liberation, was indeed a complicated character. In some circles, he was known as an egotist. Meanwhile, right down the street is another group of people who would describe him as a Gandhi-like godfather. Some people I spoke about, spoke with about him simply needed to vent, others gushed. <laughs> a few people refused to talk to speak to me at all. His self-importance is legendary even without this biography. Yet some of his worst and most appalling qualities served a broader purpose and benefited many people, while at the same time serving to beef up the profile of Morris Kite, and none of this was new information. Morris vacillated between shades of Oliver Twist and Quentin Crisp. What finally struck me was that Morris never dropped his guard. He never ever fully revealed himself, even when he was most vulnerable, and he certainly never attempted an honest and humble assessment of himself. Morris did not expect that I would travel to Texas to meet with his former wife, Stanley Beth. On three separate occasions, Stanley Beth told me the story of their marriage and life together in the 1950s. He fully expected that I would interview his youngest daughter, Carol, but he could never have imagined that eventually his eldest daughter would also want this story to be told. Stanley Beth and their two children represent the often overlooked and unintended damage from one person living in the closet. Soon I discovered that Kite's story fell naturally into the space where academic research meets old time chin wagging. There are enough inconsistencies and contradictions and I left much of those intact, partly for entertainment value, but also as it turns out, the many contradictions are in fact an important element of Kite's story and quite separately of gay history as well. Areas will remain open to interpretation and subject to perception. This book does not provide all the answers on the history of gay liberation. However, it may pose a few new questions. This biography has not been written in praise of Morris Kite and yet at times it will praise him simply because the facts and those interviewed speak for themselves. His thinking was light years ahead of his contemporaries. He took calculated risks that no one else would dare to attempt and held back from taking other actions until he knew it was strategically the right time. It would take a huge unstoppable ego to correct the deeply embedded and steadfast belief systems that made the world so hostile for homosexuals. As it turned out, it required many strong egos. The post Stonewall gay movement tipped the equilibrium of society like no other civil rights movement had or has. It rocked the status quo from the inside out and the world, in my opinion, is a far more interesting and a better place as a result. The last time that I saw Morris at Cedar sinai Hospital, I told him that it had been a privilege to be of service to him. It was important to me that I tell him that and I meant it. He graciously returned the sentiment. That was the last time that I saw Morris, except for one brief visit at Carl Bean Hospice. We spoke on the phone a few times right up to the day before he died. We talked about this book. He gave me his blessing to tell the story. Morris wished for his story to be a source of teaching, grounding, and reasoning during times of instability and change. My hope is that there is never a need for another revolution like the gay revolution. My wish is that this story will serve as a reminder and perhaps it will offer up a little historical guidance for activists, all the good people who continue to show up and make noise, the brave nonviolent social reformers who know peace in their hearts and courage in their bellies. That's me and Morris. <laughs> There's Morris. Turn the lights on. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna show you a little video. I have two videos in here uh, to show you. This first one is just who is Morris Kite? Um, let's meet Morris Kite. This is him. I always liked it when you show up and you gave up your coronation duties today, you know. So I want to give you some stuff that's not in the book. Heroes, Heroes, Texas, 19 November 1990. I used to find out who I was. I used to learn more about myself. I learned that I was not like the other people. And I also learned that that was something you didn't talk about, that you didn't advertise that, you didn't say that. Dis discovered uh, that, that I was terribly bright. I suffered uh, a great deal of ostracism. I was left out of the game. And I accepted that as a fact. 
came to Los Angeles to do with my life exactly what I've done. I had been already serving lesbian gay people in various kinds of ways, and I felt that could be much better to pass the word that I was of service on a not for fee basis for troubled or in trouble lesbian gay person. I wouldn't like myself as much as I would like to if I didn't do more about the sick, sad, and sorry state of affairs with gay and lesbian. I was not asking for money. Mm -hmm. I was, wasn't asking for sex. I wasn't asking for love. I wasn't asking for appreciation. And I wasn't judging. And I wasn't saying, how did you get in all this stuff? I would imagine in 1957, printing cards with a name address as an upfront home session and pass it out in the essential uh, gay, lesbian gallery. The board gay liberation and the board of gay community services center, Morris was a walking gay community services center. Um, you're a feminist, a pacifist, a generalist, a universalist, social services organization founder, and of course, lesbian and gay liberations. A founder in 1969 at the Gay Liberation Front in Los Angeles. The principal co-founder in May of 1971 of the Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center in Los Angeles. You were the founder in 1965 of the Dow Action Committee, a founder in so then the war in Indochina became very serious. Along the way, I founded the Dow, you know, Dr. Action Committee. We were after the Dow Chemical Company for the manufacture of napalm. We committed services of millions all over the city, fasted. We fasted at, uh, at Coronado and Wilshire for 10 days at the headquarters of Dow Chemical Company. We leafleted it. We I did demonstrations, went to Chicago, to the New Brighton National Division of Chicago, suffered heavy threats. Most of us were arrested. I had uh, uh, eight death threats. Uh, I was signed on by the FBI, I just didn't do it with the intimidation. I just didn't allow it to be part of my life. I, uh, I simply wasn't going to take their threats. I wasn't going to take their, their spying upon them. But before liberation, 1969, 70, 71, 72, 73, before that, we were dealing with people who were in trouble or troubled, in trouble with the property owner or employer or family or children or grandparents or the police or a minister or a counselor, in trouble, very physically in trouble, trouble that very often took professionalism to extricate them with, or were troubled. You see, we were always told they were sick, sinful, deviant, varied, abnormal, and a whole variety of negatives. And if everybody you meet tells you that, you can finally lie down and say, gee, what is I, I just don't think I can plow this field anymore. We urge a, a proliferation of nonviolent solutions. I find that stay outside at the ATOTS, which hung at a, at a place in West Hollywood for a very long time until we were able to front the river. Well, you never believe that such a viewer could be paused over one little time, but uh, it certainly is. And there's a lot of people right now here walking in front of Barney's Beatery who are protesting that sign. This restaurant here, Barney's Beatery, has been here a long time, 50 years, and uh, they have a sign saying, I can stay out. Now, it doesn't offend me awfully, but it offends everybody else. This sign comes out of an antique American idea to have gone out of style, along with niggers stay out. No Mexican for dogs allowed. And these kinds of things have to, have to go. I have to tolerate some vulgarity. Calling me a faggot while well, I find it offensive. I don't, I don't feel I don't feel I'm being murdered. Mark's kind, good to have you, sir. Absolutely. From the Los Angeles County Human Relations. Since 1980, you've been Commissioner of Human Relations for the County of Los Angeles. And I appointed him. Climate was different, and uh, that has changed. Uh, thanks to his pioneering efforts from I have been a commissioner for 20 years, and I've just been reappointed by Supervisor Yaroslavsky for four more years. Thousands of people lined Hollywood Boulevard. The seventh annual Christopher Street West Parade was about to get underway on a beautiful bicentennial 4th of July in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Following 
the circus, awards and trophies were presented by Morris Kite and other members of CSW for the exceptional entries in the big parade. The Stonewall Democratic Club received a trophy for best theme presentation. Time and again, in creative, loving, nonviolent terms. Meeting with, with uh, expressed homophobia is never new for me. However, I think that in general, I didn't take the bait that when commissioners acted in homophobic ways, I didn't confront them. When AIDS first appeared among us, there was great fear that it was contagious, and I urge your continued attention to finding extra funds to fund AIDS services. Thank you. You're a hell of a nice guy. And we love more. We're very proud of what you're watching. Make that clear. We'll keep coming back and coming back and coming back. We will wind you down. We simply Thank will you. not allow you to abuse gay people. We simply Thank will you. not allow you to abuse gay people. Morris, Morris, we, you, you're out of order, Morris. Morris, you're out of order. And, and, and Frank, yeah, he has been. <laughs> and I, and I don't. Gentlemen, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, gentlemen. gentlemen. Morris. You're a hell of a nice guy. <laughs> that's the sign. That that's the sign that hung in Barney's Bad 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 Exactly. Get your spelling right. <laughs> the spelling was the least of the problems. There. Um, so I'm gonna now I'm gonna go into 1970. Well, well, let me let me back up and give you a little background. 1970 was the first legal gay pride parade. And it was in Los Angeles down Hollywood Boulevard. And it was a huge success. Um, and it, there's something about that parade that most people don't know because they had no idea what to expect. They finally, they got the permit to make it legal in the 11th hour. And when they turned the corner from McCadden Place onto Hollywood Boulevard, it could have been anything. I mean, they really, they could have had anything come at them, but it was silent. Unlike today's parades, this was silent. Everybody marching in it was scared. And, I, and I'll say this again and again, that when the history of 20th century heroes is written, everybody who marched in that parade should be included. But the spectators were silent too. They had no idea what to expect. So no sooner was that parade over than they were already planning for the next parade. And here's like one of the few color photos of the early parade. And they just cleared the way. Um, and in the first, so this is, they were, in the first two parades, one of the big hits was the Cockapillar. And the Cockapillar made a reappearance in 1971. And then it was joined by a giant bass. <laughs> so the, and this, this was all in good fun, but not everyone was laughing. There were the more um, uh, conservative allies and these were actually the gay bar owners and the gay bathhouse owners who didn't want this kind of content in the parade. They thought it represented the, their new community badly. And so there was a lot of struggle going back and forth after the 70, no, after the 71 parade and then 72 happened, but there was no, there was no controversial content. And there was also about maybe like a quarter of the, uh, of the attendance. It wasn't that popular. And the more conservative people refused their support. They refused their financial support. And to Morris, it all started to sound like censorship. And there was those people in there in his group that just didn't want it. Um, and so I'm going to read to you a little bit from the 1973. So, so the 1973 parade in LA was canceled. Morris threw his arms up in the air and he said, that's it. We had the parade once or twice. It was good. Let's just move on to the next thing, because that's how Morris was. If we were going to have problems like censorship, he wasn't going to be involved. So the cancellation of the Los Angeles parade freed Kite to go to New York City to celebrate gay pride East Coast style and be wined and dined like gay royalty. The last weekend in June of 1973, he and Barbara Giddings co-grand marshal New York's gay pride parade and rally in Washington Square. All weekend, Kite was the guest of honor. That's Bette Midler, by the way, with Kite in the lower right corner. Vito Russo introduced Kite as the 
second keynote speaker at the rally in Washington Square Park. Kite was sure to thank each of his hosts by name, including Morty Manford, who housed Morris for the trip. He went on to say, at this time every year throughout America, there are graduation exercises and they always talk about promises. They're going to promise you a lot of things, the universe, dominion, progress, <laughs> domination over women, over blacks, over Chicanos, over us, over children, domination, domination. I call it the great bullshit revelation of June each year. <laughs> so that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not dominating. We're talking about sharing and loving and caring. He gets down to basics. So we have a promise that we should make one another. Nobody promised us anything except misery and destruction and genocide and despair until this generation in which we have joined together to promise one another that should never happen again. Never again will you be allowed to take our children from us. You will not be allowed to take our dignity. You will not be allowed to take our lives. You will not be allowed to deny us a home, a job, and we demand that you give us the room that we want, not to be a part of your society. I want to make a world in which we say, no more can you do that. Kite closed with brothers and sisters, I bring you nothing in the world but total mad love. Vito Russo articulated the crowd's reaction. Thank you, Morris, we love you. Kite had the time of his life. He held court, soaked up every watt of wattage of the spotlight and enjoyed being wined and dined. He was around people he could converse with, not argue. The New York activists seemed so much more mature in Kite's eyes than their West Coast counterparts. There was no infighting, no backbiting, at least not around visiting royalty. <laughs> <laughs> Kite told Paul Kane, it had been such a high energy day. It was thrilling, it was perfect day. We ate and drank and we drank a lot. And along about two o'clock in the morning, a gay man said to me, we need to get you out of here. They left the party and together they headed up to 72nd Street. Now I'm gonna fast forward to a couple of hours later. Kite went back to the village and as soon as he entered the apartment, Morty Manford greeted him. Oh, thank heavens you're here. The phone is rung all night, they're searching for you. People at the center and your friends have been calling to say there's been a fire in New Orleans. We don't know if it's a gay bar or not, but it sounds gay to us. It was a gay bar. The upstairs lounge was a popular second story gay hangout in the French Quarter of New Orleans. Later, it would be determined that the fire was caused by a firebomb thrown into the stairwell, the only exit and entrance. The fire hugged the heavy drapes and flew, and flew through the crammed bar with no emergency exits and barred windows. The few who did survive did so by squeezing through the bars of the second story windows and jumping out the sidewalk, onto the sidewalk. Manford suggests that Kite reroute himself to go through New Orleans on his way back to Los Angeles. By afternoon, both men were at the airport boarding a flight to Louisiana. Kite recalled, I went to New Orleans and Troy was there along with some other people from Los Angeles. Reverend Troy Perry, that's from MCC Church, was a pastor, his pastor's assistant and two church members died in the fire. Now I'm gonna show you, this is a clip from a movie that was done about the um, New Orleans fire. Thank you, Greg. Troy immediately assembled a diverse and experienced team to travel to New Orleans to assist with recovery and help mobilize the community. The first to join Perry were MCC Reverends John Gill from Atlanta and Paul Breton from Washington, D.C. Morty Manford, president of the Gay Activist Alliance of New York, and Morris Kite, the director of the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center, soon joined the delegation. Both men had a great deal of experience dealing with the press, city officials, and law enforcement. When I arrived in New Orleans, Reverend John Gill picked me up at the airport. And once we arrived at uh, Bill's house, it was devastation, devastation. Everybody crying. All of us trying to come to terms. <clears throat> we preachers trying to reassure everybody. No, God does not hate us. This is not God who did this any more than God killed Jews in the Holocaust. 
this is mass murder. This is not God anyway. Some human being did this, not God. It was very rough. And we had announced when we arrived that we were going to hold a press conference at five o'clock in the afternoon on top of the Marriott. And of course, we walked over and looked down, and there was the next street over was where the bar had, was at, the upstairs lounge. And we looked at the burned out front of it. So, but here we are. And the first thing that happened was we pick up the newspapers and my God, I went, I mean, through the roof and it quoted Major Morris uh, of the police department. We may have a long time find out who these people were. This is bar frequented by. Now, what I remember was thieves, burglars, and queers. So I, uh, when he said, I just hit the ceiling. I mean, I, I went nuts. And of course, the press shows up because this is the first time New Orleans has ever had homosexuals who are willing to talk in front of TV cameras in broad daylight. And I mean, we had talked before and they could tell it. And so I said, uh, you know, this has got to stop. I said, this is not thieves, workers, and queers. This is somebody's mothers, fathers, daughters, sons. I said, these are human beings who have burned to death. I said, we've heard the jokes. We know what people are saying. What are you going to bury them in? Fruit jars? I mean, comments that were made. We started passing out leaflets, all in the book array. Had thousands printed, inviting people to the memorial service. I was shocked at the businesses who put them up. I mean, businesses I wouldn't have expected. I was shocked at the ones who wouldn't put them up. And then I got a message, uh, Morris and I, we went over and, to meet with the business owners of gay bars. They hated us. One of them came and said, Mr. Kyle, you must meet with you. You must meet with the, with the people from the city. You're out there holding press conferences and saying all these radical things. We're not used to that person. You have to bear in mind that many of the people who run to that the fire are sons and daughters of distinguished old southern families. <laughs> I said, cut it out. Please cut it out. One of them made the mistake right off the bat of calling me a carpet back. <laughs> well, I'm a southerner. To call you somebody a carpet backer was a put down of the worst sort. Uh, that meant something bad. People who came and take advantage of a situation. That's the way I took it. He's accusing me of coming in here somehow to take advantage of this. I have paid my own way there. The others paid their way there. None of us had money. I mean, we were not rich people. And I like to remind people of that. We didn't have to go, but we did. And so for somebody to do that and to, to say that in such a way to make it sound like we were opportunists there, was very, very upset. That's um, from a movie on the upstairs lounge. Troy immediately. Oh, there we go. Kite and Perry consult, consoled families who were finding out for the first time that their loved ones were gay. The first was, na the, the fire was national news for less than 24 hours until it became known that it was a gay bar that burnt. The local press coverage was horrific, from dismissive to a cursory mention. The print media was downright hateful in its coverage. Eventually, Kite and Perry met with the fire marshal of New Orleans Parish. They were able to direct him away from the more mean-spirited statements. By the next day, the final count was 32 dead and numerous serious injuries. Charred bodies were stacked in the city morgue as the drama played out. Three fire victims remain unidentified to this day. They stayed for a week burying the dead. Funds were raised. Kite asked Dick Michaels, the publisher of The Advocate, to handle the donations. It was agreed that the donations would be sent to The Advocate using their post office box, accounting and banking. The seven trustees would dispense the funds. They contributed to such costs as burial, medical utilities, and rent. It was a shattering experience, Kite recalled. 
We were unbelievably inspired. We were unbelievably brave. We were pushed beyond ourselves. The New Orleans fire was a turning point. Before he went to New York, Pike was indifferent about an annual gay pride parade. He was prepared to abandon the idea altogether. If no one else wanted to quarterback the event, he was just as pleased to see it fade away. He was a peripatetic activist. He'd flit from crises to crises, identify a need, cite a solution, organize something new, write a few press releases, make a difference. He'd leave it for others to carry through or not. He'd say, let's move on to the next challenge or instigation. He was still impetuous, a bit immature in his efforts to keep things moving, just to keep gay in the public consciousness. On the flight back to Los Angeles from New Orleans for the first time, Kite longed for tradition, a bit of a routine. He wanted stability. He appreciated what ritual brought to the community and he wanted that for his community. He finally saw a gay community and he looked deeper into the purpose of that community. He craved the feeling that he had on June 28th, 1970, when they first walked down Hollywood Boulevard, out and proud. He vowed never to miss another hometown gay pride parade. Los Angeles was as much of a home as a tumbleweed like Morris Kite had ever known. It mattered not what the content of the parade was, just as long as it was big and gay and colorful and it needed to be a regular event to inculcate the celebration of being gay and allow gay to permeate mainstream consciousness, not once and for all, but habitually. A reliable stream of gay pride celebrations everywhere. He returned to the West Coast with a new insight and inspiration. He was ready to pass the leadership baton and let gay pride become its own entity and have a life. In the book, The Making of the Stonewall Myth, historians Armstrong and Craig acknowledged the power of gay pride as an institution. Had the parade occurred only once, the Stonewall story would likely not be repeated today. The power of an annual gay parade made gay pride a regular celebration, much like Christmas and birthdays. Over time, it inculcated America, will it inculcated America with acceptance of all things gay. That's the corner where it started. Again, thank you all for showing up today. <laughs> Any questions? Um, um, bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Um, get, you got to get back to the carnation. I know. I, know. <laughs> I, I do want just to everyone to know that um, Morris Kite's mother was Madam. Her name was Bessie. Yes. She and she's going to be played by Kathy Bates in the film. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yay. Um, now, uh, just as a as an after note, the fire. Um, if some people want to know who started the fire, and sadly, it was a it was a patron of the bar who had been thrown out a few hours earlier for belligerent behavior. And he came back. He was drunk, and he threw up a fireball into the only stairwell. So that but they did catch him. They did get him. Um, and he sadly died a few years after that. Um, and uh, when did Morris die again? 2003. 2003. Yeah. I, re I you know, I would, I want him to see the pride parade now with the Verizon float. And get <laughs> you know, I just missed that. I mean, it's sort of happening in the 90s, but. <laughs> well, they had court, when, when West Hollywood started to um, accept money from Coors Beer, which was blatantly homophobic. It, that, that's in near the end of that first video when he says, we will not allow you to abuse. He's talking to the West Hollywood City Council. Yes, mm -hmm. it's not a bunch of straight people sitting in front of him. Mm -hmm. And that was over the core's money. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, he would have been. Oh, he, well, oh, yeah. he, yeah, he would have missed a few hometown parades, I think, <laughs> <laughs> after all. It's, I always think of um, uh, Christine Vachon in her book, she says, every project needs a fanatic. And um, and I think about how the best activists are kind of annoying people, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> like our father Larry Kramer, yeah. he's the most annoying man, but you know, like the best person. Effective. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and I think of my small experience in, in ACT UP in the eighties and nineties, like the the most maniacal, focused people were the ones who really got out there and did stuff. And um, and you say in the end of the book that 
you, you talk about like some people thought he was an egotist, some people didn't. You really kind of um, explored the, the, that right that label. Yes, how how it served the bigger purpose. But was he like when you talked to him? Was he like one of those people who talks about himself all the time? No, he, no. he would he would actually he would give you he would give you like the first two or three questions was about you. Know, so tell me what are you doing now? And you really got to jump in there. <laughs> <laughs> if you had anything you needed to tell him. That, that was your only spot. Because <laughs> then we're going to get into, and it, it, you know, when he did start talking about himself, it was about how he was going to make something, facilitate something that needed to happen. Um, so yes, he, he, he would eventually pat himself on the back, um, but you could see how it always did serve a bigger purpose. Mm. And one other thing that struck me reading the book was how many um, committees and clubs and thing you know and there are so many acronyms that are, you know like, like hey, liberation this and, that kind of and the, the bureaucracy of activism is really um and I mean, he sounds like he really was trying to cut out the fat and get to the point he really was i i mean i think just putting gay having gay in the phone book was a first for the gay community services center it took them a while to do that um and then but i think that the and i say this in the book that the that the, the gem on all of his activism was the Stonewall Democratic Club, because that really put gay people in the, in the seat, in the driver's seat for political activism. Gay money was filtered right to where candidates were gonna support them. There was no more messing around. And before, well, around the same time as Stonewall, there was another organization called MECLA, and it's municipal elections, blah, 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 blah. blah. And it was for people who, and they were very wealthy people who wanted to contribute to the cause, but didn't want the word gay coming through their bank accounts. <laughs> and that's how, and then NECLA would filter money to Stonewall sometimes, but Stonewall survives and, and it thrives today. And I really think that was the, the major change. Now, of course, the Gay Community, uh, Community Services Center was huge um, and they were continually denied their tax exempt status. And I'll tell you, tell you something right now, when they finally had a meeting with the IRS, which by the way, their, the IRS offices were in the same building where the gay community center is now in Hollywood. <laughs> but at the time it was all IRS. And um, Morris and his, his co-founder, Don Kel Hefner, they lied. They, when the IRS said, well, you're not gonna be supporting gay causes or being used in the word gay. No, 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 not at all. All they needed was the 501c. <laughs> <laughs> and they got, they got it. And that began to change the world as well. I think just putting the word gay out into the world and making it so less fearful changed things. He, you, I mean, am I right that you say that he founded, I mean, he started gay is good, good phrase. I don't think no, that was um, Frank Hammond. Frank, oh, Frank yeah. Hammond. Yes, okay. yes. Um, and you know that he was an early, well, from Texas days when he was married, he had trained to become a substance abuse counselor. And so when he moved to LA to Bunker Hill, I located the house on Hope Street. Yeah, it's going to be a historical landmark. It's going to be have protection, it's historical protection. Yeah. Well, the one house is gone. It's gone. Uh, the There's one on Hill Street. Music Center is there on Hope Street. Oh, but right. um, I can tell you a story about that. But um, in addition to STD treatment, there was another regular meeting going. It was the very first time gay or lesbians were brought into. I don't know if it was exactly Alcoholics Anonymous. It may have been a precursor to the non-religious version, you know, like mm -hmm. Alcoholics. It was a twelve-step group for gay people. And and he because he had trained in that in Texas. Yeah, he trained in in. Um... Uh, public health, yes. and he did a lot of work with tuberculosis. And it was actually in, in um, Albuquerque, where he oh, lived in the 50s, yes. And when I went to Albuquerque for the first time to research this, that place just breathes Morris Kite. Ah. It doesn't know it, but it's mm -hmm. Morris Kite's fingerprints are all over that place. Mm -hmm. And he left, you know, amidst a scandal um, there. You know, he helped a lot of artists. And that map, what happened to that collection, that art collection? It's, in, it's at one. He left it all to one, and they have called it, I'm sure, many yes, times. They did. Yes, they did. And nobody oversaw it. But um, oddly enough, also when his that collection went to went to one, so did his so did Morris's remains. And when his they ashes? Were his ashes. And when they were closed, um, to I mean one had to close temporarily. They are closed now for a remodel. 
Yeah, they're, they're, they're going through a major remodel. Now they get air conditioning, now that my <laughs> But they called me and they have his remains and they said, we don't know what to do. I got them. So I, I'm holding on to them until we find an appropriate place. Oh, wow. Yes. So things got a little muddled after he died, but that's where that collection, and that's where the original faggot stay out sign is. Well, we should probably end, right? Thank you, How everyone. Did you want for, time? We're, we're good. We did it. What's going on It's like I'm I'm not not <laughs> they timed them perfectly for our events. Yeah. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.